Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Eden Road podcast, where on today's show, we're going to be going over the England result yesterday. Um, we're recording this on Monday afternoon, so fresh in the memories last night, Jude Bellingham heroics, followed by Harry Kane in the first minute of extra time, sparing Gareth Southgate's blushes. I think that definitely saved his job, for sure. But uh, we were just chatting before we started recording, at least... Yesterday's game was a little bit more exciting as opposed to the three games prior being probably the most boring games in the tournament. Um, but yeah, the boys are back. Craig joins me. How are you, Craig? Yeah, well, this was almost a very different episode, we can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I think I, I'm obviously working on the Euros for my day job and I said to my missus yesterday, I don't actually want to work on the Euros if England aren't in it. It'd just be bloody depressing, especially if we went out against Slovakia. And Callum... Callum is also back, back from his travels in Germany. Our reporter on the ground. Straight off the plane. Hello, everyone. I'm back. I hope everyone saw me on television last week, you know, showing the Brentford colours and all that. But uh, yes, back from Germany. We're still in the Euros. It's good to be back, boys. It's good to be back. For now, for now, I will be going back. So uh, <laughs> keep watching those TV screens, everyone. You may see me again. Let's hope we do. Remember, just before we get going, guys, drop a comment down below, subscribe to the YouTube and Spotify channels, and also give us a follow on our socials. That's at the Elam Road on Twitter and at Elam Road Pod on Instagram. Callum, I want to throw straight back to you. Obviously, you have been in Germany going to the games and stuff. Um, what's it been like? What's it been like following England away in a major tournament? Obviously, you've done it before. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd recommend it to anyone. I mean, it's, you know, the atmosphere before every single fixture has been fantastic you know and this year as well in particular you know I, th I think it's been touched upon quite quite widely that supporters have been very well behaved and you know it's been commented on by the local officials as well um yeah it's been great um really enjoyed it you know I've been out to you know the game so far and you know on the pitch not not so good as off the pitch I think off the pitch as I say the atmosphere is second to number the fan parks everything like that and you're always meeting, you're all there for one purpose, which is football, which is fantastic. Um, so a lot of Brentford fans out there as well. So it was good to see you out there as well. So that was, that was good. But no, recommend it to anyone. I mean, it's, yeah, we just need the boys to big it up a bit more on the pitch now. And, you know, we've got a lot of support out there and they'll be going out for the quarters, hopefully the semi-finals and the final as well. So, uh, and I'll be there, as I say. So, you know, come on, England. The England shirt's on again today. Come on, England. Yes, echo that very much. Let's let's go on to the performance last night, Craig. Um, I was watching it live. And honestly, I do think watching England, and I am I am cl I'm club before country, 100%, but I do think watching England for some reason makes me more nervous than watching Brentford. Maybe it's because when I watch England, obviously there's so much on the line when, it, when, it, when it's a major tournament. Whereas when we watch Brentford... At points this season, there was quite a bit on the line in terms of those kind of relegation six-pointers. But I'm always a bit more nervous watching England. And going into that final 10 minutes when Declan Rice hits the post, I am thinking, Craig, that this is <laughs> this is finished. We're cooked. <laughs> so, so, obviously, first things first, I'll just point out that the, the point of view that you and I, Mike, are going to have are going to be very different to the point of view that Callum has here because Callum's there, Callum experiences it. Um just to toot my own horn. I did do France in 2016, so I do know what it's like. Um, and that was incredible. I was at the Wales game when we beat them in the last minute. So just to put that out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, do you know what? I, I didn't... We, we, we kind of said that it was more exciting than the last one, but I think the fact that we went 1-0 down made it more mm. exciting than any other game that we've had so far. But... When we was we're getting into the dying embers of the game, and it looks like nothing's happening. We've had one. We haven't even had a shot on target because Declan Rice hits the post, and, and Harry Kane obviously puts the 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 ricochet. ricochet what's it called? The deflection back in uh, and over the over the bar. He puts it over the bar. So even after eighty five minutes, ninety minutes, we still haven't had a shot on target, and it just felt it felt like we were never going to score. It felt like we were never going to score because we couldn't create ourselves a clear-cut chance, bar maybe the one header which Harry Kane had, which he put wide from that free kick. I cannot remember us creating a clear-cut chance for us to put the ball in the back of the net. And I wouldn't even consider Jude's, although fantastic goal, 
you know, we see Wisher do it this season and then attempt and fail to do it this season so many times as well. But to see him put the ball in the back of the net with our first shot on target in the 96th minute, it's, mm. it's. I, I don't know about you guys, but I think it's concerning. It's worrying. The fact that we can't create chances against... Now, this is going to be a shoe on the other foot because we talk about Brentford all the time, about like teams like Brentford. Smaller nations, smaller footballing nations such as Slovenia, Serbia, and Slovakia, if we cannot be creating chances against teams that are going to, to not try and play football against us with the sheer firepower and talent that we have in our team, it's, it's worrying, it's concerning. I went into this tournament thinking the defence is going to be the problem. And I think of defence. Mark Gurhey, although he's going to miss the quarterfinal, which is going to be a huge loss for us, has been fantastic. He's been my player of the tournament for England so far. Yeah, 100%. I think it's good you mentioned about the fact that we didn't actually create that many chances. I watched, and I, I do want to give Slovakia their props because I know they're like ranked 45th or something like that, but they do they do have some tidy players. That Lobotka in midfield, absolute baller playing for Napoli. And the two centre-halves, like the way they were defending their box yesterday, I think that's one of the best defensive performances from a centre-back partnership I've seen at the tournament so far. They, they, every single cross that came to the box, that they headed clear. But even Slovakia's opener against Belgium when they got that shock win, Belgium, Lukaku had three goals written off. Like they, they were creating chances. That game, while Slovakia defended well, probably shouldn't have ended up with a Slovakia win. So the fact that we didn't create any chances, any clear cut chances, didn't have a shot on target until Jude Bellingham in the 95th minute, it definitely is concerning. We're going to get on to Jude Bellingham. But Callum, first of all, mate, thoughts on the lineup. Kobe Mainu was the only change. Obviously, the Gallagher exper experiment didn't work, the Trent experiment didn't work. Kobe Mainu was the only one in. No start for Cole Palmer. Foden still playing on the left. We didn't see Gordon either. But thoughts, thoughts on the lineup. He doesn't like changing it, Mike. That's the problem. You know, I, I think I, I'm a big fan of Mainu. I think you know we've seen at Manchester United of the type of player he is. I, I, I really like him. He's direct. He's not afraid to have a shot and go. But what I have seen of him over the Euro so far, and I think it goes with a lot of the players as well. They look a shadow of themselves for their for their club team. Um, there seems to be none of that, you know, you know, like like I was saying with Mainu, like that directiveness, you know, getting at goal, having a shot. And um, yesterday, for example, where we had we had no creative opportunities whatsoever, and you know, until we scored the ninety fifth minute. Um, Cole Palmer, he was the man of the match for me yesterday. Um, as soon as he came on. He was the one player who was looking to create opportunities for, you know, for, for the um, for the front, for, you know, for Kane, um, for anyone really. Even Bellingham, obviously, with his goal, um, he needs to start in the next game. He really needs to start. Mainu, I'll be dropping him to the bench. Obviously, we're going to be forced into another another, you know, tactical change because of uh, Goe is now going to have to be suspended for a game. Who is he bringing there as well? But the answer to your question is, I'm actually surprised um, that he didn't make more changes. But this is Southgate. He never, you know, we've seen in the past, haven't we, where he doesn't like to change the team too much. He believes in the squad that he has. Um, Harry Kane, he, I don't think he should be starting at the moment, personally. He looks again. He doesn't fit in. You know, I even said in the, um, I've said even in this, the last, in the uh, Slovenia game, where in the last game of the group, he was so frustrating. He he was dropping inside too deep that he's now not quick enough. If we can get forward quick, he's behind the ball. No one's in the box. Um, Ollie Watkins, he came on against Denmark for 25 minutes and he was running in behind. He's got that extra pace. He should be starting, personally, in my opinion. Ollie Watkins is a 20-goal-plus goal scorer and he's not getting a an eye in at the moment. I really don't understand why, to be honest with you. But you know, it's a but it's a I, tough call. It is that, a tough that, call. That but. that that change for Watkins came out for Watkins in would require a complete change of the way that we play because of the way that because of the way that that Harry Kane is a play through striker. We we had this conversation before as well where Harry Kane is a play through striker which means the ball goes into him and he brings other players into it. 
Watkins is not a play. He's group. not. He's play not. Group. He's not bringing players into it at he's all. Not. At the moment, he's at, not. At the moment, he's not. You're completely right. And and the last four games, well, even yeah, all four games that we played, he's he's not been fantastic. He's not been the Harry Kane that we've been seeing over the tournaments over the last sort of three or four tournaments that we've been in. He's not doing that. But to bring Ollie Watkins in would require a complete change of the way in which we're going to play. However, what I will say, I'm all for it. I'm absolutely all for that change because it would mean that we have to attack more because Watkins will not do that dropping deep to get the ball. We would have to get the ball forwards and it would then bring bring Saka in, it would bring Foden in, it would bring the Newcastle player in, it would bring Palmer in. But what, it's more what I think it... straight away. It's more pace straight away. There would be more opportunities created through having that kind of player, you know, and I love Harry Kane, but also as well, I must touch upon, I really don't think he's a good leader on that pitch. You know, he, there were times yesterday where he was completely lost. The, the, the players were panicking. The fans were getting on the players' backs as well. And he's just standing around and, you know, he looked completely lost. And, uh, you know, we need someone in there who's going to get that team ticking, getting that team talking to each other, communication, calming everyone down and saying, listen, you know, this is what we need to do. And Harry Kane's not doing that. He's not doing it for me. But the question is, who do you have as captain, personally, other than that? Who, Declan who Rice, would, I would probably say, is a good shout. I think he's a Carl good Walker. leader. Carl Walker. He's having his, well. Carl, Carl Walker's having a stinker of the tournament as well. Yeah. I think... It, it, it is funny when we talk about England because it's like in on the one hand you want to when you're like saying oh we want to drop we want to drop Harry Kane and bring in Watkins you got to be realistic in what Southgate's going to do. Personally, I don't think you can drop Harry Kane just because you know forty odd goals in the Bundesliga. He's been the best one of if not the best striker in the world for the last kind of five or six years, probably longer than that, and. It just makes it more perplexing because obviously I know Watkins is a good striker and I know we know a lot about him as Brentford fans and he's had this insane season for Aston Villa this year. But the fact that we haven't seen Gordon and the fact that he didn't bring Rashford with the way we're playing now, we've got Bellingham, now Maynou's come into it, who's more like going forward more than Rice, which I'm a little bit surprised about. But like you said, he's shown so much promise. I think he was our best player yesterday. We've got... Bellingham, Mainu, Foden and Kane all occupying that space in mm. in between the lines. And we've got no out ball on the left-hand side. We're going to get on to Kieran Trippi, but it just it makes it so much more confusing that we haven't got someone like Gordon in who's going to run in behind so that when Kane and Bellingham and Mainu are in the middle of the park, they've got an outlet and they're not just passing it to each other. It makes it so much easier for teams like Savaki, who's set up in that stubborn back line to just... You know, all the traffic comes down the middle and we just look clueless when it goes out to the left and we don't have someone that can beat their man on the left-hand side because Foden's drifting in and Bellingham's in there and Mainu's in there and we don't have Trippi because he doesn't have a left, it doesn't have a left foot. That's what makes it more confusing. Like, personally, I wouldn't drop Harry Kane just because he's, like, he's Harry Kane. He's undroppable for me. I don't I, I don't know what you think about that, Callum. Well, yeah, that is an argument. That is very true that, you know, he is undroppable. Um, but what we're in a tournament now, we, we, we've moved on a lot as, as a country. We have these players available to us, um, and he's not, he's not utilizing them, I think. And he's got to take risks. I think, look, you know, Harry Kane, as I say, he's been a fantastic servant for, for England and what he's done in the Premier League and what he has done for Bayern Munich this year. But he's not fitting in this current squad at the moment. It's as simple as that. And I've had a bit of hate on social media because I put a joking tweet out saying Ivan Tony's done more than eight minutes than than uh, than what Harry Kane has done all tournament. But it's true. I mean, even the pundits were saying what Ivan Tony did when he mm -hmm. came on the pitch yesterday. I mean, this is going a bit off topic because we were talking about Ollie Watkins. But if that is what it's uh, if that's what pundits are even saying as well, that a striker like Ivan Tony is doing more than than what. Harry Kane has done, then surely you've got to look at the, the, the Watkins scenario in this as well. As I say, he, when he came on against Denmark, I was incredibly impressed with with Ollie Watkins, getting around, not afraid to run in behind the back line, creating opportunities. He had a very good opportunity as well to score. He was creating problems for their back line. And 
This is why I want to see more from Harry Kane doesn't offer that because he hasn't got the pace. Yes, he's got the finishing, but he's got nothing else. He, 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 you know, he, <laughs> even, nothing he, else. He, he hasn't got anything. He, oh, he holds the ball up. Yeah, great. But that's about it. Like he's coming too deep. You know, it, it's not. I and mean, if we're playing against a team like, you know, like we were yesterday against, you know, Slovakia, Slovenia as well, where a team is happy for you to have the ball, then there's no point of having someone like Harry Kane on the pitch because he's playing too deep. We want someone running in behind the opposition, creating that space Gordon. on the pitch. Absolutely. We need, we, need, we need players like that on the pitch. Harry Kane is not doing it for me. It's as simple as that. Now, Switzerland, I mean, flipping it. I mean, you know, we've seen they've beaten the reigning champions. You know, this is no mean feat, I tell you. And we've got to turn up because, you know, the whole country is expecting more after the back of this. Um, yeah. But, you know, should we still be in the tournament? No, I don't think so. I think it would be. I think that I was I was waiting for the uproar on social media when oh that was. Oh, it, it would have been it. it would have been oh, so toxic. It was brutal. It would have been monumental at that stadium. It would, it would have been unbelievable it during the game. No, absolutely. And do you know what? I think they did it um on on the game against Slovenia as well. And I must say, you know, it caused a big stir in the stadium. This is I've seen it a lot of Brentford as well, where you have a divide where some are saying, Okay, calm down, we've got this. You know, everything's going to be all right. And then we then put a performance in like yesterday, for example. Um, and others are like, no, 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 no. You know, this is simply not good enough. And I'm inclined to agree with them on that because, you know, people spend a lot of money, a lot of time off work, um, have a huge passion in following England as what it is. And they're proud to support England. And when you've got a team of players like that on the pitch who just simply aren't playing well and not playing well as a team... You know, we're supposed to be the favourites in this tournament, aren't we? This is what the this is what the press are saying. And we're not correct, we're not doing it. We're not we're not doing it. Craig, and how 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 sorry, Callum, to interrupt, but okay, Craig, no, how, how how positive are you? Because I I think, and I don't know if I'm just being a stupid England fan, but I'm more positive than most people. I know we didn't have control of the game against Slovakia per se, but I mean the stats. It was it was clear to see Slovakia's game plan. They did it to a T. Like they created some openings in the first ten minutes. They got their goal and then they sat back. England dominated possession, but we couldn't break that break them down. And I feel like whilst against Denmark we we didn't dominate that game at all. It was much the same against Slovenia. Um, obviously, it got a little bit nervy towards the end of the Serbia game. But it, you know, you can see the patterns. I, I'm more positive than most because I'm just waiting for it to click. I'm waiting for Southgate to make the necessary changes to get the best out of the best player in the Bundesliga, the best player in the Liga, the best player in the Premier League. Like the the talent that we have in that front line, for me, it, it's too good for it not to work. But I think I'm more positive because I think even in the last kind of 20 minutes against Slovakia yesterday, when we went to the back five, that was probably when we looked the most dangerous. So I'm hoping... And I know we've said that Southgate doesn't like to change things, but the reason I'm hopeful is that he sees that and he learns from it and he maybe makes some tweaks in the Switzerland game. Maybe he starts Palmer, maybe he pushes Saka to left back, which a lot of people were laughing at before. But I feel like we did, even the way the when the ball was switched out to Saka, just the fact that his body's open and there's an option to go down the left, as opposed to when Kieran Trippi is there and he's looking straight back into midfield and he's not finding Foden on the left because he's already in the middle. But if he makes the changes... That's. I'm just hoping. I'm. I'm not an idiot, Craig. Tell. Tell me if I'm an idiot. I. I don't think you're an. I don't think you're an idiot in the sense <laughs> that we want these things to happen. However, you're expecting something from someone who has a track record of not doing what you're now expecting them to do. You're saying I want Southgate to do this. I want Southgate to do that. Southgate's been at, at, at the at the helm of the England team for what, eight years now. Has he ever done it? Has he ever done no. it? That's the question. No. Exactly. So so the, the fact that you're expecting a manager to completely change his style and philosophy in the quarterfinal of a major European tournament, <laughs> that's where you're going a little bit crazy. That, that, that unfortunately, is not going to happen. What we can see is, as a problem as fans is obviously very different to what he can see as a problem as a manager. However, we... we he... We... We had this conversation about 
you know, the way Thomas Frank talks about players and the way that we as fans talk about players when we was having all the conversations about Ivan Tony, in that mm-hmm. we have a vested interest as fans, he has a vested interest as, as it's his team. So he will always put out what he thinks is his best team. And he will not change. He will not be swayed. You could not change his mind if you tried. He is set in his ways and he won't be broken from the mould. He won't be broken from the mould. It pains me every time Conor Gallagher steps on the pitch ahead of, of other players. Like, like even if you put Trent in the middle, you haven't given Adam Wharton a minute. You haven't yeah. given him a minute in four games. You know, we're, we're like one of the only nations to have not used every outfield player in this tournament. We're, we're, yeah. almost, we're almost the only, only nation to have not used every outfield player in this tournament. Because there is a refusal from him, for whatever reason it may be, to try something new. And yeah. I saw in a post-match interview that Gareth Southgate done, and he said Ivan Tony was 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 devastated that I only gave him ninety minutes, ninety seconds. <laughs> not surprised. And I, I'm not su- I'm not surprised at all. That I don't know about you guys felt like a pity substitution. Felt it was just like- throw the kitchen sink. It was like that was Plan C. <laughs> well, I must I must say the supporters were not were not happy. Um, I was hearing boos and um, the, it you was don't fun. know what you don't know what you're doing is what was what was being sung. Now I I thought at the time I thought people wanted Watkins to come on the pitch, um, but you know he should have his substitutions were too late yesterday. He, he was just pissing oh, around. Nice. Like, you know he he made his first sub I think with 15 20 minutes left to go, and I'm looking around. I'm thinking to myself. Oh. You know what? What? What is it? What is he waiting for? You know, there, there was there was nothing changing in that game whatsoever, other than Declan Rice hitting the post. Nothing was changing in that game whatsoever for England, um, and it was only for a bit of brilliance for Bellingham that we're still in this competition. Um, you know, now I must touch yeah. upon Bellingham to be honest with you, because he's caused a stir since yesterday, hasn't he, uh, with his press conference? And saying what about the England fans? Yeah, absolutely. I don't agree. I do not agree with what he said there whatsoever. It's all well and say it's all well and saying. Look, you know, you know, there there are people, uh, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. Yes, we are entitled to our opinion, and you know, he obviously doesn't agree with it. But the and he's putting pressure. They're they're putting pressure. We're putting pressure on the team. Yes, we are because we can see a team there of what should be the best football players in the world. Like Bellingham, for example, he's one of the best players in the world. And they're not doing it. They're not doing it. And and I touch upon again, you know, you've got some of the best support out there, spending all that money going out to watch them, the passion. Football is one of the biggest sports in this country. And they're not playing. They're not playing at all at the moment. And he he should, again, he's got some hate on social media for his, for his press conference. He really needs to watch himself because I... I admire Jude Bellingham. I admire what he's done from such a young age, breaking through but from Birmingham and going to Borussia Dortmund and now doing very well at Real Madrid. But those press conferences are not going to help him at all. Like mm. he seriously needs to take back, take back, have a think. You know, if he, he should think, okay, well, being in the stands like we are, watching on from afar, and then he'd probably think to himself, this is shit. This is this is not good enough. Like, you know. Get the get the gist of the room, Jude. Honestly, get the gist of the room. But For I don't sure. know what you I don't know what you boys think of it. I mean, my obviously, you know, with what with what you do. I, th- I mean, you know, I it's... think he's probably he's probably frustrated massively because, and I want to talk about Bellingham's game in particular mm. because he is like like you said, he's one of the best players in the world. I mean, on last season, he probably was the best player in the world. Mm. If England go on to win the Euros. And he's the reason why. He's probably in for a Ballon d'Or shout. So he's probably massively frustrated that the England team is playing so poorly and he's having he's the one having to bail them out. Like, I think if anyone is going to say that about the England fans, he's probably like the most qualified to say that because of how good because of how he's pulled us through this tournament so far, the goal against Serbia and the goal yesterday, which just out of nothing. Like it, genuinely, the feeling you know sometimes in football in the last ten minutes when you know you're pressing, you're pressing, you're pressing, you think you're going to get a goal. I, I take it back to the Man United game at home last season when we were just like, if we didn't score in that game, it would have been an absolute travesty. But you always had a bit of a feeling that we were going to score in that England game last night. I had none of that, genuinely none of that. It wasn't going anywhere. And Drew Bellingham pops up with just 
to even to to score a goal that late on when we played so poorly, fair. But to do the bicycle kick, the Ronaldo esque bicycle kick, it was it was just insane. But I feel like if anyone's going to say that about the England fans and you know have a pop back, I feel like he's probably best place to do that just because of how he's dragged us through this tournament. But I do agree, he does need to read the room. Yeah, absolutely. But England fans are frustrated. I think most England fans will be frustrated with Southgate in that, like you said, we've got this crop of players who are the best players in the world at the moment, but he can't seem to make them tick. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, but I'm definitely going to click that out for social. So thank you very much, Callum. Um, You're welcome. Go on, Craig. Well, we're talking talk about <laughs> Southgate and, and, and how the England fans are going to what, portraying their thoughts, shall we say, so eloquently. Um Strong thoughts. Strong thoughts. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we scored two goals in two minutes. Granted, one of them was right at the end of the game uh, and one was right at the start of the extra time. From the goal in extra time to the end of the extra time, so the 28 <laughs> minutes that we had was steel shit. It was really <laughs> bad. We were, we were winning that game. And when we went 2-1 ahead, 2-1 up, you could see that they were gone. Their heads had gone. Absolutely, their heads have gone so so here, and we could have we could have put 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 the knife to him and absolutely put Agreed. that game to, to bed. Agreed. And we did, but we yeah. didn't. We ended up going a bank of six, a bank of four. Six At times times. in that game, we were playing a six a, a six four. We didn't have an outlet going forwards, and whenever the ball broke into that midfield area, which is where Ivan was, because everyone else was so deep, he's had to drop deep. We then push it out towards Sacco on the left, Palmer on the right, or, or Eze on the left, or Eze, or ever, wherever anybody was. We're already sat on the edge of our own penalty area because that's where all 11 players are. He's He needs to break out of this, again, something that's not going to happen, break out of this mindset that when we go ahead, we are going to see a game out every time. We need to, to go out to win games, not... To not to trickle across the line, to, you know, crawling back towards what is considered, yes, we won. <laughs> it's like that I mean we won it, but at what cost? Because that mm. was dreadful for 118 minutes. 118 minutes of, of, of actually pretty, pretty dire football, you know. And this is, this is, we, we've watched some some players play for, for England over the years. You look at this squad that we've got now and the fact that we've scored four games, four goals in four games, which you might consider to be a, a, a success win if you're just winning winning one nil every game and you're getting through it, but you're not. But then you're going to list off the players that we've got in this team. You know, if we start with Ivan, we start with Harry Kane, we go Jude, we go Foden, we go Saka, we go the Newcastle player, we go Eze. We go- <laughs> Price. Yeah, you've got an incredible amount of talent in which the manager refuses to use, refuses to use. And people can say he doesn't refuse to use it. How, how, how does Adam Morton have zero minutes this, this tournament? How does a Newcastle player have zero minutes this tournament? Yeah, he yeah. is refusing to use all of his players. That's the only, only, only explanation is he will not try something new because if he cannot see that we're trying to sit back and see out a 2-1 victory when people are tired in extra time just to try and crawl over the line against a team in which, on paper, we are significantly better than. Mm-hmm. We made that incredibly, incredibly hard work. I do not enjoy watching England play. I do not look forward to England playing. And I am not confident whatsoever that we will reach the semi-finals of this competition. <laughs> Cheers, Craig. <laughs> Way to bring me back down to earth. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> let's, let's, um, I do, just, just to end that section, um, I was listening to the commentary. Uh, obviously, I was listening to it on the radio, but I was watching the game as well. But it's you're right i think the commentators at the time were saying you know we got that harry kane got the goal and it looked like we were pressing forward and all the commentators said get the third goal quickly because we had the momentum and it was just predictable gallagher came on concert came on we reverted to type it was defensive and then it makes the last 10 minutes really really nervy 
And if they'd have scored, oh my God, if they'd have scored and we'd have got out on penalties, I don't know what would have been more toxic if we'd have lost to them in normal time, or probably if we'd have lost to them in extra time and then penalties. But it was, I do want to give Southgate a little bit of credit because I feel like a lot of people were clamouring for Bellingham and Kane to be both taken off. And I think he said in his post-match, the reason I kept them on is because these are special players and they give you special moments. The, the Bellingham one, he did look completely out on his feet and keeping him on, and I think a lot of people would have taken him off. It would have been him or Foden, but Foden probably looked more dangerous in that game than Bellingham did. But I do want to give Southgate just a little bit of credit just for keeping those two on because obviously they did they did pop up with the goals. Um, let's talk about Ivan Tony a little bit more. Obviously, we've been extremely frustrated with him this season. We've given him a lot of criticism for his performances in a Brentford shirt, deservedly so, what with the interviews in mind and sort of his attitude on the pitch. But, I mean, he's probably one of the headlines. I, I feel like a, there was a lot of people yesterday saying, including you, Callum, Ivan Tony's done more in a few minutes than a lot of these England players have the whole tournament. And rightly so. I think when he came on, I would have been fucking pissed off with Southgate giving me one minute at the end of the tournament when it literally looks like we're bound to go out. Um, but he makes he made a difference. He, re he really did make a difference. And do we expect to see more of him now, Callum? Do, like, obviously, I think Southgate said in his post-match that um, he brought Ivan on because he felt that he could offer a little bit of that chaos that we needed to get the goal. And I think if you actually watch the Bellingham goal, Ivan actually does really well in creating that space by just dropping onto their centre-half and then Jude can kind of pull off and obviously the rest... The rest is up to him, but he does have a little part to play in that goal. But he did, he, he the, the Slovakia defenders seemed to handle Kane pretty adeptly the whole game. And then Ivan came on and it was a bit of a new challenge. He was winning fouls, he was winning headers, putting himself about. And he, he was a bit of a game changer, Callum. So do we, do we expect to see more of him? Uh, probably not, to be honest with you. <laughs> other than <laughs> it's, it, it goes back on to the whole aspect of what Craig was saying earlier. If we have someone like Ivan Tony come into the equation, we will then have to change how we play again. You know, it, I, I, I can't see Ivan Tony starting a game for England, say. Um, I just don't think, I don't, I don't think it will happen personally. Um, would I like to see more minutes, however? Absolutely. But then he's then got the issue of, you know, who does he bring on? Watkins or, or, or Ivan Tony again? But yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, there was a heat map yesterday of, of where he was winning fouls, where he was getting himself around. The BBC was showing it yesterday. And I, I, do you know what? He was he was everywhere. And that that is what we've seen, you know, not as much last season because he came under a lot of criticism. But we've seen it at Brentford. And, you know, we, he was taking it into the game yesterday, causing a lot of problems for, you know, for the Slovakia back line and winning those free kicks. Taking the pressure off England, that was something that was touched upon yesterday. You know, he was winning these little niggly fouls in, in areas of the box, just breaking the game up slightly and taking the pressure off us. Um, but yeah, I, 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 can't, my, I, can't, I can't see him getting a starting position. I really can't. He, he, you know, he, he, there, there is a goal scorer in there. Yes, absolutely. But we have to change the whole whole team around Ivan Tony and Southgate's not going to do that, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, I think he might maybe look to him more as an option for the bench just because of the impact that he had. And you're absolutely right. We've not seen that from Ivan Tony at all this season. Like he's been pretty, pretty shit. And I think he, even he would admit that. And the criticism that we've given him probably deservedly so, because you know, all the build up we've gone through it a million times, but when, when you get Ivan Tony on his game, he is such a handful. And I think Thomas Frank said before, and we've said it before, I don't see many better strikers in the league, in the world, even as far to say that. Honestly, when he's on his game, he is a massive problem for a defence and he will score goals. Um, it's just whether Southgate, he, he won't start him, 100% he won't start him. Yeah. But seeing a Brentford player, even though it is Ivan Tony, in a major tournament for playing for Brentford, it is... It is fever dream stuff, Craig. What were your thoughts when he came on? I mean, he didn't get much time, oh. but it was still it was still pretty. I thought it was still pretty cool just to see a Brentford player come on for England in the Euros. Obviously, we've seen him playing friendly, but it's not quite the same, is it? Yeah, I, as I said earlier, and I, I did feel bad because I felt like it was quite a pity substitution. <laughs> yeah. Um, like uh, you know, I bought you along. You've gone through all of this stuff. I might as well get you on for a minute. You know, um, like I. I as a person, I'm, I'm absolutely buzzing for him. You know, he's 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 got his chance and he's 
fully grabbed the ball by the horns. I thought he was fantastic when he came on. Um, Brentford posted a few stats about his performance just in the in the the half an hour that he had. He was the most fouled player on the pitch mm-hmm. in the entire game. In the entire game, you know, he create he he got the assist. He created the, the chance. He won four out of five ground battles. He won four out of five aerial battles as well. This is in, a, in half an hour of football. Half an hour of football. Yeah, it is. It was a. It was. It went from a moment of, a moment of. Oh man, he gets a minute at the Euros. He gets one minute at the Euros to. He could score the fucking winner. <laughs> he could score the winner. And I, Genuinely, I did, when he when he I went through it, yeah. I did put a little bet on. I did put a little bet on, and, and I should have definitely put to score or assist. So I did put Ivan Tony to score England to win an extra time one 0 He'd have loved that. He'd have loved and, that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was one for you, mate. I was thinking about it, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, it was like um, it was it was sort of he changed the game actually in extra time more than what I feel Harry Kane could have done because Ivan's, you know, he's a busier body than what I feel Harry Kane is. He's a busier body than what I feel he is. Um, man, we, we watched in England, I watched a Brentford player play for England at the Euros, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, no. it's, it's something that you don't really ever, ex- never expected to happen as a Brentford fan when you start supporting the club. But, mate, if this is the norm now, and if it were for injuries, we would have had we would have had a left-back there as well. Yeah. It weren't really <laughs> no, he wouldn't have taken him. No left. way Southgate would have taken him. <laughs> we would have had a bloody left-back there. <laughs> but, yeah, man. Anyway, let's... Um... After all of the stick that we've given him and after all of the grief and whatnot we spoke about, and, yeah, you know, credit to him. He took his chance. Just don't be a dick about it when you come home. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about the Switzerland game. Um, we've mentioned the changes that we'd like Gareth Southgate to make. Uh, do we think he's going to make them? Probably not. Um, I'd love to see. Cole, I think Cole Palmer has to start. Whether that Saka dropped or whether that Saka at left back, I'm not sure. But Cole Palmer, it was evident from the game against Slovenia that he needed to start. We only looked like we were going to score when he came on. When he came on again, he changed the game. He got sucked into the pressure, I think, a little bit towards the end. But the first kind of 10 minutes he was on the pitch, it just brought a spark to the team that we hadn't seen in the first 60 odd minutes. So I think Cole Palmer has to start the back five. Of... He did that in both of the games in which he came on, Cole Palmer, just to add that. In. Yeah. Yeah. He did yeah. that in both of the games in which he came on. I think the back five, I mean, the Swiss just worry me. I think they've been really good this tournament. They absolutely dominated Italy. Granted, it's not a great Italy side. And they were dominated by Spain as well. But it's how are you feeling going into it? Like, I, I'm, I just feel like I am just a bit of a hopeless romantic with England. Until we're out, I will believe that we're going to win the whole fucking thing. But <laughs> I don't know if I'm just being. I don't know if I'm being just stupidly optimistic. But I do. If Switzerland is a game. I think we can win. Mm-hmm. I if, agree absolutely. If and it's a big if. He's for me. He has to look at the changes. He really has to. Like Palmer's the main one for me. Palmer, he's changed the game in both games, like you said, Craig. He's he's the obvious choice going into that Switzerland yeah. game, Callum. Absolutely, and I, I mean, I look back at the Germany game in the last sixteen in twenty twenty or twenty twenty one. It was in, in, when we when we played that particular Euros, and that was a game where I was absolutely drilling as a supporter, going to go watch because I thought at that time with the with the caliber of players that Germany had we were going to lose. And that was one of the best England performances I've ever seen. Granted, it was at Wembley with a full Wembley crowd behind them, but they put in one of the best performances I've ever seen from an England team. We need to somehow channel that into a performance on Saturday. Just, just, just get through, just get through to the semi-finals, and then anything is possible. You know, you're one game away from, from the final in Berlin. Just, just go and put a good performance in. Show the show the country what we know this team can do, what the players know, what we know the players can do. Um, absolutely, Mike. You know we sh- we we should we should do it. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. We should beat Switzerland. 
and I can see the performance coming this weekend. I can see it. It's gonna. We're gonna get goals this weekend. We are going to get goals. <laughs> there you go. I'm claiming yeah. it. It's gonna be three, three nil, three nil England. I tell you, we've got this hands down. A nice early goal, and then we're gonna do what we haven't done yet. We're gonna go and kick on. We're gonna go and kick on. We're gonna frustrate Shakiri. We're gonna frustrate their midfield with Zach Jacker. We are gonna get Xhaka sent off, and we're gonna win this game three <laughs> nil. England. We're going through to the semi-finals and then we're going to beat the Netherlands. Job done. We love it. We love it. That's what we like to hear, Callum. We might actually have Luke Shaw back as well. He was on the bench last night. So maybe... No I don't want him. Maybe... I don't want him there. I don't want him. Why? I, I, he's a half... He's a player, right, who's not even fit. He's played... He's been on the bench. He's hardly... He's not even involved in training today. Like, they're training he's at not. the moment. He's not even in... The, he's not even training. You know, mm. what, what, what? why is he even there? I... I we probably, you know, everyone's touched upon this. You know, what, what, yes, there's a player in there, Luke Shaw, and I think he's done brilliantly in the Premier League, and he's a great player for Manchester United. But fuck's sake, like he should, he should, excuse my French, but he shouldn't be there. You know, what is the point? It's like when we took Theo Walcott to the, to the World Cup in 2006 and Sven didn't even bring him off the flipping bench. Like it's just like, what's what's the point? Like it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know. It, he explored the option with Saka at left back yesterday. I just don't think just watching the game yesterday, it was so rigid down that left-hand side. And every time Trippier would get the ball, the one, the one time he got the ball and actually went down the wing when Kane dropped deep and fed it to him, Foden was offside anyway. So it didn't actually matter, but he's just, I uh, Trippier is a good player. He's just playing out of position and there's no left foot and there's no width and on that left-hand side. It's what contributes to it being so congested in between the opposition's defensive midfield with with the likes of Bellingham, Kane, Foden, all dropping into the same position. We've got no width. So please, we have to see some changes. We've got to see the Newcastle player, as Craig calls him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful. I hope we can do it. Let's let's finish that England section for now. Um, let's touch on Denmark a little bit. Callum, I'll hand over to you, our, our biggest supporter of VAR. Thoughts on those decisions for that Germany game? Did you manage to watch it? I did. And I'll tell you now, I was in the pub at the time and I said, he, he is, he's not he's not giving that in the Premier League. Stuart Atwell, simple as, and we've seen him from League One upwards. Flipping heck, surely we could have sent a better official than Stuart Atwell to the flipping Euros. I mean, flipping heck. But that, that that's, you know, they had, um, from what I understand, ITV, or I think it was ITV, had a, uh, a, a former official on and she was saying, Nowadays, they've changed the law and regardless of whether you're standing here and then, you know, only a few yards away, you know, you are and your arms up like that, regardless of the reaction time, they're going to give that as a penalty. Now, I don't think that's fair. Like, his arm wasn't out that far, you know, and I don't think that's given in the in the Premier League. I really don't. We're going to have this argument now for the rest of the season. So, Denmark should be wound up with that one and that, and then, of course, the offside. I mean, margins as well. I mean, oh, flipping it. VAR getting involved in that. And that would have changed the game as well. Because if Denmark mm. go 1 0 up, then, you know, I mean, it did help him in the first half because obviously you had that big break as well, you know, where, where it kind of disjointed the first half. But VAR has gone against, it's, it's ruining the game. It's refereeing the game. No way should they be looking at that. You know, Mike, if you look at the. Not to go on too much, but if you look at if you look back, the only player that went up for that for that for that handball was the player who put it into the box. I'm not sure mm. who it was. No other German player went up for that handball. Now, what does that say? You know, they yeah. didn't think it was a handball. So VAR is just refereeing the game now. And Michael Oliver should have been stronger there and said, you know what? I don't th- personally, in my opinion, his reaction time is not enough. You know, it's nothing. Yeah, it was absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. They've got that little sound detection thing on the ball now as well. So it's like there's no chance you can get away with it. (laughs) Premier League, like Jesus Christ, we're going to be having this on the big board at the G Tech. A little sound, (laughs) a little soundometer thing like that. I'll be looking at bloody hell. Like it's just, it's ruining football. We don't ruining football. I I don't know. I, 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 I. I don't know who that American woman is. Um, 
Not, not. I don't mean that in an offensive. I mean, I genuinely don't know who she is. No, it's awful. I don't know why they've. I don't know why they've brought that in. Like someone to explain it, the rules of the game. It's just. It's, I yeah. Think it's, it's, so strange. I, it's very strange. That, <laughs> they definitely brought that in because they've pissed about with the rules before the competition has started. So they brought someone in to explain them to try and get across the methods of their madness, in which they're tinkering with the rules. Of offsides, of handballs, uh, offsides sort of a clear cut decision now with this semi automated stuff. You're either offside or you're not offside. That that is now offsides are the only factual thing in football. It's the only factual thing. Everything else is subject to opinion, and that was a VAR opinion that that should have been a handball, which is why they suggested it to to. Michael, was Michael Oliver was the actual Michael referee? Oliver. Michael Oliver to then go and look at it again. But as Callum said, they're re refereeing the game. Um, but she said, I'm certain that she said in the post match punditry stuff that the ruling around handballs is, is different to what it would be in the Premier League. So she said that wouldn't be a handball in the Premier League. So why, 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 as a governing body, are they allowing now? I don't want to see it in the Premier League. I don't need to see that snickometer, whatever it's bloody called, um, in the Premier League. But why, as a governing body, UEFA obviously cover every competition within Europe, as in there the FA is governing body, and we have to comply with certain decisions that the UEFA make. Why on earth would they have different rules for different competitions for the same sport? Mm. I'm 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 unsure why they would tinker with the rules before a competition has started, and then get someone in to try and explain why they've made this stupid decision. <laughs> it's just about rationalising this stupid decision they made, but yeah, no, it is strange. I think Dan Merkel had hard done by, but I mean Germany Havertz. When Havertz goes through one on one, it's just you just know he's going to miss. Oh, it's just so. Oh. It's so uh, strange. He's so, I think I really rate Havertz. His movement's incredible, but he gets himself into such great positions then always cocks up the finish. Did it for Arsenal countless times last season. Did it geez. twice in that Germany game. Like Germany <laughs> should have won that game, could have won that game by four or five. But, I mean, at the same time, like you mentioned, Callum, if, if Anderson gets the first goal, then it is a completely different game. Rasmus yeah. Hoyland will definitely be really losing sleep because he, he missed a couple of chances. I, I was surprised. Well, Jensen didn't feature at all, did he? In, in any of the Denmark games. I don't think he came on once. Yeah. Which is a bit which is a bit of a shame. Norgard came on a few times. Damsgaard came on against England. Um it's a shame for Denmark because I feel like they kind of drew the short straw with coming up against Germany who look like they're really starting to purr. That Spain Germany game is gonna be a classic. hundred percent it's gonna be it's gonna be a great game. Can't Absolutely. wait to watch that. But yeah on the on the Denmark side of things it, it's a shame they've gone out. Um, obviously, I think like Dan mentioned on the last episode, you always kind of I'm always looking out for their results and watching their games if I can. Uh, shame not to see some of the Brentford players make more appearances. But I'll... I must say though, um, I had the privilege of meeting a lot of Denmark play a lot of Denmark fans when I was out in Germany, and they are a really good bunch, and they know a lot about what what Brentford is trying to do at the moment in the Premier League, and um, certainly they watch us at length. And they, I tell you, I, I saw them coming through in Frankfurt. And they had this big, um, there was there was about a thousand, fifteen hundred of them just walking down the street in in droves. They did it in three or four lots with a police escort, and they were fantastic. I had my little Brentford flag there, and they, you know, were coming up, shaking my hand. They know what we're trying to do at Brentford, and you know their their fan base is fantastic. And yeah, as you say, they just they pick the short straw. Really, they've got the squad there, but they just you know that side of the draw. I mean, even yeah. if they beat Germany, Spain in the Spain. next round. And then possibly France. I mean, ugh, you know, what you know, you got to beat the best teams, haven't you? But you know, it's that's that's it. That side is just, oh, yeah. Uh, it, it's up the Danish bees, though. Up Danish bees. Though. It's nice to hear the that Danish they. That, yeah, exactly. Let's um, let's get on to the last section of the podcast, boys. Archie Gray. Um, <laughs> where do we start with this one? Obviously, a couple of days ago, David Ornstein broke a story. I'm normally when David Ornstein breaks a story, I, I normally take it. A scripture it's going to happen but when it's Brentford there is a little bit you know you have to do take it with a pinch of salt sometimes I definitely went too early with some tweets uh making a mockery of some Leeds fans and they have bitten back a little bit now that the deal has collapsed obviously the Athletic reported yesterday that 
despite a medical being passed, no deal was agreed, which I don't know how football transfers work. I don't claim to be an expert in it, but I just, I'd, I'd, I don't really understand why you would ask him to come down for a medical before the deal was done. But anyway, I don't want to get into that because, like I said, I'm not an expert on transfers or anything like that. But, you know, Leeds, Leeds, Leeds fans are bitten back today saying it's all gone quite over there. I've already replied to say, you know, he's still going to leave. It doesn't matter if it's Brentford or Spurs, he's still going to leave your team. So it's a bit strange. But, I mean, I think the main thing, Craig, the only thing that I could think of, just the outrage from Leeds fans when it was reported that he was going to fucking Brentford, which was trending on Twitter, which is always fun to see. But I think the main thing or one of the main reasons, just pure conjecture, is that like the reaction from Leeds fans, the pressure from Leeds fans, that if he's going to go, he's going to have to go to a bigger club than Brentford. Um, and it would have been a lot of money. It would have smashed Brentford's transfer fee record and we would have spent, what, 68 million or something around that mark that we spent last year. We would have almost equaled that with one transfer. It's not really the Brentford way to be spending that much on a player. Granted, Leeds fans would definitely say we would have doubled that money in a couple of years' time because they really, really rate him highly. But, you know, you also have to take that with a pinch of salt, um, you know, just considering how fans of their own clubs obviously big up their players a lot more than looking in from the outside. But reaction to it, Craig, <laughs> predictable. Well, yeah, the, the, the sad part is the feeling of ine inevitability that it's going to fall through. You know, we unfortunately seem to have picked up a track record of wanting to sign these these exciting players and one thing or another will stop them from joining you look at bakayoko at psv you look at um, nuso at bruges now you've got archie gray and i'm sure there's others in which i'm forgetting as well but it's it's the inevitability of failure with the transfer which is becoming sad um we need a we need like a big pickup signing just to kind of get the fans back on board with what people are now labeling as a bad transfer you know recruitment team when we got into the premier league when the last few seasons in the championships we was we was praised so highly for for all of these transfers that we was doing and since we've been in the premier league people have been picking at that you know that part of the football club picking at, at the fact that the transfer recruitment hasn't been as as, as maybe the level, as high a level as what we expected it to be. Um, I do, unfortunately, have a friend who's a Leeds fan. Um, everybody has their faults. But he, <laughs> he, he's saying that it's happening. Um, and and this was a this was at like a 10 to 1 on Saturday. I said, don't worry, it'll fall through. And then <laughs> fall through. So it's just, it's just sad that there is an in a, inevitability of failure. That's a bloody word. I can't get off my tongue. Yeah, it's it wasn't. I think just the fact that I went too early with the tweets, it just made it a little bit. I, I don't know. I don't know why I was confident. It was false confidence. You do have to take the, the Brentford deals with a pinch of salt. Callum, I'll let you come in, mate. It's the problem with being in the Premier League, Mike, unfortunately. You, you're up against teams in you know the top six. We can't compete with them. It, 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 it all comes down to what they'll be paying the, 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 the player. That's, that's, that's literally it at the end of the day. Um, but I think he's bonkers to be honest with you because you've said, all right, Brennan Johnson's worked out quite well for him. But you look at you know, DJ Spence, uh, Spence Jeff when he Spence. went there, DJ Spence, Spence. <laughs> DJ Spence. <laughs> I was trying to think of his name there for a minute. I was like, I had it visually, but he uh, he, but you look at him, he's now struggling. He, he's just been released. Ryan Sessignon, as well, for example, again, another player who went there with huge, huge potential. He's he's now without a club. Um, for me, I would use Brentford as a person who, he's obviously his agent's probably turning his head as well, which doesn't help. But, um, you know, use Brentford as a stepping stone like, like people have before because he can come and have a good few years with us. He's only 18 years old and then he could then move to a bigger club. Like, you know, it's... But the only way of looking at it from here, and this is nothing against Matthew Benham for what he's done for Brentford, but the only way we're going to be able to compete with, with these big teams is having a new investor coming in and putting in huge, huge, huge money to allow us to spend, you know, that extra money on players and paying them that extra money as well. Because there's no way in hell we can afford to pay, you know, what what Tottenham will be playing Archie Gray. There's no way in hell we could do that. 
you know that's how the ericsson thing fell through as well for example you know we tried to smash it smash our record but we were nowhere near Manchester united so off the hook i think you know i love matthew benham but the only way we're going to compete is with new investment you know yeah well it might come soon you know yeah. with with the developments last season who knows yeah. but yeah was, it was, there, was, there was also lots of of talk and rumors that that he was kind of pushing through the move to happen to Brentford because he wanted that move to happen. Yeah. But then now the rumours are that he can't join us because we won't match the payment plan in which what what Leeds want. So it's it's think, it's it's all a bit confusing, isn't it? As well, Leeds Leeds think, are probably yeah, think... being difficult. Leeds are probably being difficult. They've had a bad week as well. They're now being sponsored by Red Bull, so their fans ain't <laughs> happy about it. But it's uh, I think Leeds just need to remember, you know, you know they are a championship club these days. <laughs> so I know. Honestly, I found it hilarious that the Leeds fans were like, "Oh, it's all gone quiet over there." It's like, he's still gonna leave, you fucking idiots. <laughs> the same thing happened with Pontus Janssen. If you remember, boys, they were so pissed off about Pontus Janssen coming to us, and yeah. you know, Pontus came. I remember after the playoff final, he he thanked Leeds for for what you know they had done for him and they were still sour. They, they, you know, they were like, why have you gone to Brentford? And since then, the only time they've beaten us is because we had nine men on the pitch and we didn't give a damn on that day because quite frankly, we were safe and they had to win. So we had nine players on the pitch and, you know, that was that. You know, I hope they buy a few of this because they've been doing that recently on social. So, you know, all you've got to do is breathe around them and they buy it. Anyway, <laughs> you, know, you don't even have to mention leads and they'll get angry at something that you've done, mate. Yeah, let's, I think that would be a good point to end the podcast. Let's all laugh at Leeds. It, it, it's funny. He, Archie Gray will go. Probably not Brentford. I, I wouldn't write it off because I think we're still interested in him, but maybe one that got away. Never um, anything else. Never anything else. Yeah, exactly. The Inner podcast will be back after the next England game. Hopefully that will be a win. We play Switzerland on Saturday night, so we shall return, obviously, the week after that. Uh, but just before we go, guys, remember to drop a comment down below. We want to hear your thoughts. We didn't get that many comments on the last England video with regards to Gareth Southgate, the lineups, the changes, what we want to see from the next game, whether England are good enough to beat Switzerland. Let us know in the comments. Remember to also subscribe to the YouTube and Spotify channels and also give us a follow on our socials. That's at the Elam Road on Twitter and at Elam Road Pod on Instagram. Craig Callum, it's been a pleasure as always. Up the Danish, please. Yeah. Up the Danish, please. There we go. Okay. <laughs>